welcome um, to this talk um, today. Um, I'm very pleased to um, welcome Cheng Wei Liu, uh, who, if you've seen the email, will know he's now uh, at um, university in Berlin, but he can tell you a bit more about himself. And um, I just want to hand over to Cheng Wei and um, say thanks for for presenting today. Um, thank you. Uh, and um, Lana is now going to going to host because I unfortunately have to go off and um, uh, attempt to meet a deadline this afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is a, a, a joint social data science, behavioral data science. Uh, seminar uh, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, Chen Wei with us today. So Chen Wei started his uh, career in Taiwan, but then he has a PhD from the University of Cambridge. He, I know him mostly as a person who worked on the skill versus life topic. However, he has uh, written a lot of really cool papers and uh, recently he's been working on um, diversity and uh, how our society actually is adapting to artificial intelligence and various technological advances. And we're ha very happy to have him with us today. And he's going to talk about really cool topic. I have to say that we are completely oversubscribed today with this uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with this seminar, and uh, effectively, um, we are also kind of trying to stream stream this live for those for those people who are not able to join us on Zoom. So the floor is yours, Chiang Wei. So much, uh, Ghana, for uh, inviting me, um, and, and Rob, of course, uh, for inviting me for this talk. And uh, it is a great pleasure to share with this uh, society um, about my theory and uh, uh, data uh, about luck. So as you can see from my share uh, slides, so the topic today is, um, well, when we observe performance differences, uh, either in business, entertainment, or any domain, you name it, how can you measure the impact of luck? And in more, more importantly, should we attribute successes and also failures uh, more to the skill differences or more to uh, dumb luck? So that is a question we try to uh, address today. And uh, let's uh, kick off the, 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 the conversation or talk uh, with the quiz. So here we have uh, two observations. So on the left hand side, we have uh, New England Patriot. So what they did in uh, season 2007 is that they won 100% of the games in that season. And on the right hand side, we have uh, Chicago Bulls. So what they did in uh, season 95, 96, this cross year, but still one season, they won 88% of the game in that season. Uh, which performance is more impressive? So which one are you going to choose? So probably you can pause for a minute. I mean, today there's some technology glitch, so I'm not able to use the Zoom uh, quiz function, but I think we can just uh, use the chat, uh, if you like, to input your answer. You can just select like a uh, Patriots or Bulls uh, for representing your, your answer, or simply one or two. One means Patriot, and number two means uh, Chicago Bulls. Great. I mean, yeah, some input uh, different answer and some uh, already gave him very thoughtful uh, responses. Uh, it all depends, isn't it? So that's great. How the matches are arranged. Yeah, definitely. These are very legitimate uh, questions to be asked. And I think this is just a, a interesting illustrated example, right? So, yeah, so probably we can stop here and let me show you one of the key audiences um, in the institute I teach, business school, of course. What do the managers uh, think about this? So here is the, the survey results I got from my students, exactly MBA students and MBA students and not in the UK uh, only, like Cambridge and Warwick and also in the US, like MIT and Boston, where I used to teach some electives uh, over there. The majority of them uh, chose the New England Patriots. So the perfect performance 
they believe is the most impressive one or more impressive one among the two. And there's a minority, of course, uh, when for Chicago Bulls. But interestingly, there's always uh, one or two students from each cohort, probably like the one who asked, uh, it depends, or uh, write, uh, it depends in the comment, raise their hand and uh, challenge me, asking me, why am I asking this misleading question? And this is a very legitimate response, isn't it? Because now you probably realize one of them, well, New England Patriot, is from uh, National Football League. And Chicago Bull is from uh, NBA basketball. So they are from very different contexts. Why should I compare the two together? While this response is very uh, sensible and legitimate, uh, my prior research uh, published in, uh, published in uh, PNS actually suggests if you have to pick one of them, there's a reason you should pick the less than perfect one, which is the Chicago Bulls. And this is an interesting illustrative example because there's a very uh, straightforward answer to, uh, well, to uh, justify why this uh, uh, perfect performance from New England Patriots can be too good to be true. So in this case is, well, the number of games, right? So just like uh, mathematics or statistics 101, so in terms of averages, when you have a much smaller sample size, well, extreme values are much more likely to be observed compared to uh, like NBA when you have a much larger sample size, isn't it? And also another justification is that, well, this is what people do every day. If you think about like the top uh, performing firms, the best business school, best university, people mix apple with oranges. So they don't care about the context, they just want to know this ranking and the presumably those have higher performance must have done something right, has a pure quality or whatsoever. And this is like uh, what this, uh, the context of this comparison also, right? When you mix apple with oranges together, we should be careful. The outlier in this case is more likely to suggest there is something strange or interesting about the context. Exceptional performances tend to occur in exceptional circumstances. But that's, of course, not how humans usually think. Again, we usually think the most successful, they should be our benchmark for uh, more reward and we should learn from them benchmarking. Uh, however, my research suggests, well, we should be careful. And more formally, uh, this is the so-called performance non-monotonicity, suggesting that higher performance may not always be associated with a higher quality or higher skill. It can be negatively associated uh, with uh, each other. And the formal condition we can prove mathematically, and of course uh, you can find the proof in our paper, is really very simple. If you conceptualize performance, it's a combination of uh, skill and luck factor. So whenever this luck factor is more impactful, in the formal sense, it has a more uh, fatal distribution, then uh, the most extreme performances, of course, are more likely to have a higher value drawn from this more variable distribution, the luck factor than the skill factor. And when that is the case, expected skill, of course, can be non-monotonically uh, associated with performance, meaning that higher performance can associate with lower average merit, skill, quality, and so on and so forth. And this luck factor can really be generalized. It does not necessarily just mean like a, a random shock in one period. You can connect to this uh, very famous uh, Matthew effect or simply the rich get richer and the poor get poorer uh, reinforcing processes. So whenever this uh, reinforcing processes can be very, very strong and allowing some actors without top quality, but have early luck and continue winning, then this association, this kind of a, a shape association, if you like, is likely to observe empirically. So now some of you probably can already link to social inequality, right? So if someone happened to be born in the right place in the right time, this is early luck. But then you're also in a society with very strong rich get richer dynamics. Then again, the, the most wealthy person in the society, well, they may not have the, the highest uh, uh, merit, quality skill, and so on and so forth. And actually in other projects, actually this is what we found over there. But it's really controversial. So we try to be very, very careful before reporting the actual results. Otherwise, of course, uh, everyone can, well, we'll jump on that. So, but let's focus on something else uh, today. 
And let's focus on, first of all, what's the implication of this uh, research program uh, on predictions? And this can actually help us to conceptualize luck and link into empirics uh, in some way when we connect to the idea of regression to the mean. And one of the motivation for this uh, 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 conceptualization is really when you talk about average skill, average quality in terms of a formal modeling or computational model, it's really simple, right? You just assume a distribution and draw from that. However, empirically, Measuring luck is really, really challenging and people do not necessarily agree how that can be conceptualized and measured empirically. But regression to the mean actually allow us to have some way to have a proxy of this expected quality. That is the average future performance, right? The expected future performance. So if luck plays no role whatsoever in performances, what is the association between current performance on the x-axis, for example, and expected future performance. Well, this uh, 45 degree line probably is the expected association, right? Meaning that if you observe someone winning 100% of the time in a context where luck plays no role, you should expect this person to achieve the equally high performance in the future, isn't it? Also 100% winning rate. This is what 45 degree uh, line, of course, imply. And 0% winning rate followed by 0% winning rate. No regression to the mean. When luck plays a role in performances, things become uh, more interesting, of course. So let's consider the other extreme case when uh, the performance is entirely determined by uh, randomness or luck. The association between current and future performance then is probably this flat line, isn't it? regressing totally to the mean. So let's consider a typical example when people talk about the impact of luck, like uh, rolling a die. We have six possible outcomes when rolling a die. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if it is truly random, the best guess you can have for the expected value for your next row is the average of all six possible outcomes, isn't it? In this case, about 3.5. It also suggests that no matter what you observe in the past, it doesn't tell you anything about the future. You should always, or your best guess is to regress to this flat line when the outcome is entirely determined by luck. But of course, in most naturally occurring situation, we are not at this uh, two ends of the spectrum, right? We're somewhere in between. Skill or quality play some role, but luck play some role as well. So we should expect this a flatter association, flatter than the 45 degree line, but also steeper than the flat line, reflecting both influence from the skill factor and the luck factor. So of course, this also means that if you observe someone with exceptional performance, like 100%, the future performance is going to regress downward to the mean, say 75%. And also very low performance going to regress upward to the mean as well. And the idea behind this is pretty simple as well. So performances, very high performances involve, of course, probably higher expected quality of skill, which will make performance persistent, right? However, very high performance probably also entails a larger component of luck. And luck by definition is the variable factor. It's not going to be persistent. So the future performance, that's why it's going to regress to the mean value. And the PNS paper we had is like one step further. We want to show, and we show actually demonstrated that this regression to the mean effect, conventional understanding is almost kind of assuming this monotonic association. But here, our model suggests that sometimes this regression to the mean effect can be so strong in some performance ranges, so it can generate this non-monotonicity, almost specifically negative association between current and future performance. So in this, uh, just like a toy model or illustrated example, that is e exactly the case. So both exceptional performances regress downward to the mean, but the more unreliable one, in this case, the New England Patriot, they regress much more uh, downward to the mean compared to Chicago Bulls. And you, you can connect to this uh, disproportionately more to the mean. Uh, for this outliers, right? They're too good to be true. That's why they suffer more regression effect also. 
And uh, my research program or focus right now is to go beyond this uh, illustrative example, right? If you know sports, definitely can come up with a lot of alternative explanations. So I'm going to show you some data set I collected. Actually, I collected uh, a data set for this paper and more for other projects. Here, we want to systematically examine this um, uh, association in performances as a proxy of the impact of luck and to um, suggest uh, what can be the implication. And due to the, uh, in the interest of time, of course, we can uh, go through all of them today. I'm going to just talk about three of them today. But before I show you the results, um, I think uh, it's useful to think about what is the motivation of finding this less is more effect for performance non-monotonicity. So one of them is that if you think about in a society or in any learning system, um, higher is better is the usual heuristic we have, right? You want to learn from the better classmates or firm want to imitate the better performer in their industry and so on and so forth. So whenever, if the data suggests the less is more effect emerge, it's usually unexpected. People do not expect that. People assume otherwise, they assume the opposite, that higher performance are better, that most successful, they must have done something right. So this can lead to, of course, is pricing. If you lead to and um, link to finance, this means that some of the individual, very successful one, they can be rewarded for their good luck, and some of the very poor performing one, they can be punished by uh, their bad luck. And in terms of uh, uh, resource value, basically mean mispricing, right? So this is my other paper. I'm uh, just uh, forthcoming in uh, Oak Science. It's about arbitrage opportunity. So if you're the more informed one, the strategist they can actually exploit this uh, opportunity. But also it can lead to superstitious learning, right? If you think about if the best performer is not the best, best is not the best and the worst is not the worst, but you believe otherwise, then a lot of this uh, learning imitation can be detrimental. And of course the consequence for cultural evolution evol and uh, uh, this kind of competition uh, can also have very interesting uh, or undesirable outcome. So that's the motivation. Identifying this uh, uh, less is more effect uh, is uh, pretty interesting per se and also have important implications. So let's start with the first uh, data set, the billboard uh, 100. So the reason I spend some time to elaborating on this uh, regression to the mean gra graphs because the empirical strategy is very, very straightforward and identical to what I show you. The association between current performance and future performance. So in this case, the current performance is for the same musicians. What is the rank they achieve on this Billboard 100 chart? In this case, of course, in this context, the lower the better, right? But of course, I, I move then a reverse the scale, so the higher performance on the right hand side. Then the y axis represents their average future performance. So for the same musician, what is their expected uh, performance for their next single on the billboard? So now let's consider uh, a quiz. I think uh, now you can also use the chat uh, uh, function for this uh, billboard top 100 musicians. What the association should look like in your view? So if you answer one, if you put one there, that will represent your belief that, well, luck probably doesn't really play a role, meaning that the association will be very close to 45 degree line. Or if you believe luck is really important in this entertainment area, billboard music industry, then it should be closer to the flat line. So one or two. Two, I can see, well, currently, okay, I should not comment on that yet. I'll leave you the independent thinking uh, to unfold. Oh, nice to see some familiar names here. And uh, it depends, of course, that's that almost uh, always correct. <laughs> that's good, uh, Mark. Great, so uh, I believe those who wanted to input your answer already did this. So I guess uh, this is uh, probably a slight majority um, uh, went for number two. So let's take a look at the results. Does that surprise you? So I guess those who answer number two, in this case, is probably, sorry, 
is probably uh, closer to the actual association. So let's think, first of all, regression to the mean definitely happened, right? Because it's flatter than this the grade line, which is a 45 degree line. And also if you focus on the top performer here, so those who got like a top three single for their current single, well, regression to the mean is very, very strong. The next single on average regressed to mediocrity, just slightly above uh, the median in this case. But the important question we want to ask is also um, whether there's a less is more effect. So I have done the statistical analysis for you. For those who are interested, this is the method, um, not the quadratic uh, regression, which is very problematic for identifying a U-shaped uh, pattern like this, but two lines test. And the idea is basically build on the um, this continuous regression model. But the contribution of this paper is really find a more uh, a better way to identify this cutoff. And Simonson call it the uh, Robin Hood cutoff. In short, it, it reinforced the poorer. So the poorer side with the lower statistical power will be given more observations. So that together both line, uh, the overall statistical power is maximized. So that's how you determine the optimal uh, cutoff. And when you can claim there's a significant inverted U shape in this case, is when the two lines, they both have significant correlate coefficients, but the sign is different. Our uh, sign are different, the opposite to each other, as simple as that. And in this case, of course, I ran the analysis for you and uh, not, expect, uh, not surprisingly, inverted U shape indeed happened. So higher performance indicate higher future performance up to about 22, uh, uh, rank 22. But for the top performance, the top 22, negative association occur. So the higher your current performance, the lower your future performance. How could this be? So let me give you a well, example as a hint. Anyone remember this guy? I can't see many of your faces, uh, but I guess it's uh, probably obvious to many of you now, right? The Korean uh, musician, Sai, and this is his uh, winning single, the dance uh, based on his winning single, Gangnam Style. Definitely very, very popular, uh, billboard number one and so on and so forth. But what we're interested in is, well, what is his next performance? Not surprisingly, um, regressed downward to the mean a lot. Well, still pretty good because he still got another Billboard 100 single for his next single, but definitely not as good as to his first exceptional success, like a Gangnam Style, isn't it, right? So, and this a regression to the mean is so strong that it generates this uh, danger zone, if you can, if you like, in the sense that this negative association suggests, well, for Billboard 100, this context and the top 22 performances, we should be really cautious in the sense that their current exceptional successes probably indicate the impact of luck is so great that they cannot replicate that in the future, right? To such an extent that their association is negative. So this is the danger zone in this particular context. So let's consider another analysis of the same data set, but now let's uh, change the union analysis. And this is of course relevant to many because this is the uh, firm level, right? So this is the, the firms, the record labels behind all this musician. And again, current performance versus expected uh, future performance for the same record label, what is the expected rank for their next single? And the question is still the same. So now it's your opportunity. Think about it. Given what we've seen about the musician, well, do you think luck plays no role? Answer one. Otherwise, answer two, if you believe that luck plays an important role. One or two. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting. Anyone still try thinking? Okay, so 10 more seconds.
All right, let's stop here. Okay, let's see the result. I think the majority is go for one, isn't it? Okay. So I guess those who answer one, you're absolutely correct. As long as you're talking about normal range of performance, up to about number fourteen. Higher performance indicate well higher future performance as well. As you can see, regression to the mean still happen because it's flatter than the forty five degree line, but it's much closer to that compared to the musician level. And this is not surprising if you think about it because these are the firms. They have resources, and some of them have resources, and some of them, of course, do not. And these performance differences, of course, should be attributed to a lot of this, uh, a lot to this uh, uh, resource differences, right? Because the more resourceful one, they can buy their airtime, they can promote their musician as they like, strategizing basically. But here, the results suggest there's a ceiling or upper limit about the room for managing and strategizing. So the top performance in this case. Regress downward to the mean dramatically, and the negative association is much stronger than、uh, the the musician level. So this suggests that the danger zone is really in this top fourteen. And when you observe this、uh, record label, they have the top fourteen singles. Again, you should not be impressed. It probably suggests that they're really kind of、uh, extremely exceptionally lucky instead of、uh, exceptionally foresightful. So this is what this、uh, result suggests. And taking together, I think probably now you can see. Of course, this is an approach with many limitations. However, it's also pretty useful because it can be applied almost to any context where you have the information about consecutive performances for the same actor, right? Then it can give you a measure of the impact of luck on that context. And this result also suggests that well, this、uh, impact of luck can vary across performance ranges. And also union analysis, like、uh, we think that the musician level, you can see stronger regression to the mean、uh, on the top, and of course、uh, for the label is even greater, the greatest on the top performances. So the most successful, they are associated with greater luck. And also different union analysis, as you can see, the association between these two union analysis is very different. And also have an、uh, interesting strategic implication, right? So if you're in the music industry and a lot of your rivals are purchasing or chasing the stars, now you know you should avoid that, right? Because on one hand they may be too expensive, on the other hand they actually do not have the highest future performance. You should go for the second best, isn't it? Second best here actually have a clear bit definition. Is the individual or or firm that have the high but not the highest performances around this、uh, non-monotonic kink, and they actually have the highest、uh, future expected performances, and probably not so many of your rivals are going to pay attention to them. So this may be your opportunity to arbitrage. So that's the theory of、uh, or strategy of arbitrage、uh, I developed in my other paper. So that's the uh, the billboard uh, illustration. So I, I I saw、uh, many of、uh, some of you at least、uh, are from academia, right? So the second data set probably is、uh, pretty relevant to many of us、uh, being evaluated、uh, for tenure decision and so on and so forth, partly on、uh, our academic work and the citation we receive. Now the、uh, one of the original idea discussing this dynamic is the Matthew effect, right? So、uh, many people believe science and evaluation insights may be efficient, but、uh, sociologist Robert Merton suggests, well, it's not, not necessarily the case. And a very strong、uh, Matthew effect of the rich guy richer and the poor guy poorer process can also occur. So here, the data set is I collected like、uh, journals from fifty、well, domains. So together, we have one thousand and twenty journals. So across all different fields, millions of articles. And then the association we're analyzing again is the、uh, different compared to many、uh, existing studies because we already knew what's going to happen if we do that at the author level, right? Given what we know about the、uh, uh, Matthew effect, if you're analyzing the association between the citation between the current paper of the author and the next paper of the same author, it should be very close to the 45 degree line. Not necessarily because they're great or the top performer there is, is great, but very likely to be the uh, uh, Matthew effect working, right? So here our union analysis is the journals. So what can we say about the journal 
and the association in terms of the citation between their current volume citation uh, rank and their next volume citation rank. So do you want to have another uh, round of a uh, guess? So in academia for this journals, what do you think the association should look like? Again, if you believe, well, luck does not really play a role, quality wins, good journal or top journal are really great and better than the rest, then of course, number one, it's uh, 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 closer to the 45 degree line. If you answer number two, you probably believe noises, randomness really prevail in academia also, so it should be flatter. Let's have uh, 20 seconds here probably. Okay, great. So I can see, wow, this is the unanimous uh, one. So that's great. I mean, everyone has a strong confidence in academia. I'm a, yep, that's a definitely a, a good thing. But here's the result. Again, you're not wrong. In the sense that, again, for low range of performances, uh, you're right. So it's pretty close to the 45 degree line also. Again, regression to learning happened, but here is the strange thing, right? It doesn't appear to be like a negative association occurs, not like a billboard data, but it's kind of look pretty flat. So if we apply the same two lines test, that visualization is correct in the sense that we cannot really reject the hypothesis that it has a negative association. But the fact here is also is that it's just not different from zero. It's flattening above certain threshold. So meaning that in this case, the Robin Hood cutoff is about 430. So this is across different fields. So in general, if you receive an article that achieve like a higher than 430 citation in that journal, you probably should not be too impressed in the sense that this journal, the next performances will be just about the same. For, the, for those journals who receive this outlier and also for those journals who do not receive these outliers. And this is actually uh, also the, the same if you change the union analysis, like um, the, the 52 fields, uh, uh, 1000 journal is probably mixing too many apples with oranges. So if we focus on this uh, ranking, the Financial Times 50 journals, which is very important a uh, ranking for business school ranking. Uh, and then the association is also positive but up to certain range and then flattening out uh, beyond that and you can also separate that into the six uh, major fields in my data from natural science all the way to business and management and this association is very uh, very kind of uh, uh, similar also positive and then kind of flattening out above certain range particularly in business and management and engineering and the computer science so they, you can come up with uh, uh, many possible explanation about why this flattening out uh, occurs. I would love to learn what you think. And here's just one possible explanation uh, from me. And I would love to learn what you think. So really it's related to this uh, math theory fact, isn't it? So to what extent we should attribute this to outliers? Those articles receive uh, several uh, order of magnitude more citations compared to the rest. Is it really they have this disproportionately high quality or they just abandoned it from this Matthew effect? A lot of people cite that paper because they know that it's written from a famous author and everyone knows that you have to cite it if you submit to a certain journal and so on and so forth. And more importantly, don't forget the union analysis here is journal. So the judgment or the skill we are talking about here is probably the editors. So should we believe that those journal volume who happen to have an article with like 5,000 citations say, should we attribute that to the editor's foresight in selecting these highly cited papers or not? Dumb luck, for example. And this analysis basically to suggest, well, but above certain uh, cutoff, then this judgment foresight does not really play much role. It basically regresses to the flat line, right? The expected quality of good enough journals. But if you think about how academics are evaluated, this is really problematic, right? Because a lot of these impact factors are based on 
expectations. Of course, there's some adjustment existed, but a lot of the outlier, of course, will kind of boost the impact factor of many journals. And this is another article that's relevant, uh, written by a management academic, free writing on power laws. Because when you compute this impact factor based on this kind of outliers, that meaning that a lot of journal, they can benefit from that a lot and uh, uh, being a front runner on this uh, ranking games. But then my results suggest that, well, wait a second. The very top journals in terms of having the highest impact factor, this analysis suggests that they may not be that much better than the good enough journals. Beyond a certain threshold, they're all the same. And uh, this should change a lot of uh, evaluation practices in academia, if you take, uh, if think about this seriously, isn't it? So that's my explanation, but I'm happy to learn your view about what you think about why we have the flattening out pattern. Next, um, what about bad luck? So I think the two data that I talked about is more highlighting the role of good luck. So like billboard happened to have this early success and word of mouth effect. And academia may be about the method that also kind of boosting this um, uh, highly cited journal articles. What about bad luck? So this is where we can consider the auto raising uh, uh, data set, which is very uh, interesting. Uh, Formula One and NASCAR. And today I'm going to just have time to talk about the Formula One data set, well, which Ghana you know a lot about. So I look forward to learning your view as well. So. Again, the analysis is the same compared to previous uh, data set, the current performance of the driver and the performance of the same driver for the next race. Here is not across year, but within a season. Uh, of course, because a lot of things can change across seasons, so that comparison will be unreliable and irrelevant. So we focus on for the same season, the consecutive races. And then, of course, different year, different season, they have different number of drivers. So we have to kind of uh, normalize it so that uh, this uh, almost 60 years of data can be uh, compared against each other. So in this case, we, of course, uh, kind of have this uh, rank, uh, well, <clears throat> kind of normalize uh, based on the year they have. And then we also have this no point driver kind of group uh, for the same uh, data points. So now the same question for you. So in this context, particularly if you follow F Formula One, what do you think about the performance association? Again, number one, no luck. Number two, important luck. Thank you for continuing inputting your answer. I hope my uh, previous exercise did not frustrate you so you refuse to give any answer. This is actually the last one of the talk. So uh, if you like, uh, do input your answer. There's no more. Very good, let's probably uh, stop here. So I guess this is uh, almost like a draw. I think slightly more uh, select two. So let's take a look. Well, so again, we see a less is more effect, isn't it? So two, meaning that the luck is important in this case is depending on which performance range you're talking about. So again, if you talk about the normal performance range, actually regression to the mean happen and it does not matter that much. Particularly if you look at the top performance, top drivers, those who are on the podium, top three, for example, there, uh, future performance is still pretty impressive, expected to be the highest, still on the, po uh, I mean, number one in the current race, they're still expected to be on the podium, top three for the next race. The less is more effect in this case happen in the lowest performance range. So the worst performing driver in this case. And this slide just to show you, this is also significant, uh, passing this uh, two lines test. So what can be the mechanism? Well, the mechanism actually is pretty interesting. If you think about or follow Formula One, well, accidents happen a lot in this context. And if you look at the Formula One website, their official coding, actually many of these drivers who did not receive point or have to retire in a race, they attribute 67% of this type of uh, a no point or uh, retiring from the race to accidents by definition. 
there's no obvious systematic factors can be responsible for this uh, very low performance. But also this paper is uh, one of my favorite paper by James March, while well, basically my advisor's advisor uh, who was in Stanford, unfortunately he passed away um, three years ago. But this paper actually suggests another very important reason when we should expect this less is more effect. So this paper highlights the side effect of competitive selections. So um, uh, those who are being selected from a competition, of course, on average, they're better. However, the side effect is that the variance among them is also smaller. Then if you continue these processes and think about the top um, uh, people in a system, in this study, they focus on this uh, president, right? The superintendent in, in school system, or if you think about the CEO in business, they're the top surviving multiple rounds of selections. On average, they're pretty good, but probably there's very low differences in distinguishable, in distinguishable differences among these top executives, right? Again, the important differences is that I'm not saying that, or they are not saying that this superintendents or top executives are unskilled. No, we're not saying that. We're saying that their skill differences is so small that's indistinguishable. But then when you observe this huge differences amount, say Fortune 500 company and so on and so forth, why should we attribute that to the CEOs when their skill or quality are so uh, similar? We should instead attribute that to good luck and bad luck, isn't it? And back to Formula One, this is also the case. The Formula One driver, they're elite drivers. They are, have to select multiple rounds of selection before becoming one of the Formula One drivers. So when these failures happen, it's unlikely that they're really kind of very poorly drive, poor skilled driver, careless driver in this context. It's much more likely to be the impact of bad luck, factor beyond their control, isn't it? Also, the asymmetrical impact of luck suggests that here, you do need to have excellent skill uh, to win in this uh, context. You may be lucky in one race, but it's not an, uh, going to enable you to, to win. If you look at Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, they're top of the top in their uh, uh, cohort. And that's what enables them to be top in this context. Skill is really, really important. So this also suggests that, well, good luck is not sufficient to win, but bad luck will be sufficient to ruin your performances. But fortunately for them, most of them uh, can kind of come back next race. That's why their future performance regress upward to the mean a lot. If you think about this, this is really different from other contexts, isn't it? Because in other contexts, you think about coaches or football teams or sport teams and executives. After they experience failures, they may be fired and would, would not really have a chance to show this regression to the mean effect, right? This will become a major source of superstitious learning. You don't know that actually you'll punish someone for their bad luck and treat them as a, a scapegoat because you don't observe this uh, regression upward effect like the Formula One. This said, I actually analyzed what happened to this driver with more this kind of accident failures in one season, what happened to their career. Unfortunately, they're also more likely to get fired. So this is uh, really unfortunate. So similar to their fate, uh, to the coaches and executives, isn't it? And this paper is probably all, all informative. Sometimes even the insider, like Formula One team, they knew the impact of bad luck, but they really need to think about the market or the stakeholder or, or this uh, advertising sponsor and so on and so forth. If they're naive and cannot see this impact of bad luck, then the Formula One team may need to fire this driver as a result because the pressure from the stakeholders. So I also studied this in my other project. But now you can see the impact of law is pretty um, important, right? And sometimes it can be invisible. It can bias uh, learning and reaction and evaluation a lot in, in many contexts. So what? Um, well, this is one of the study you can connect it to the romance of leadership in, uh, in our field management and organization science. And it shows that, well, for the perceived performance uh, and how we attribute this perceived performances to leaders. Well, in fact, we attributed the lowest performances and the highest performances more to the leaders. And if you connect to the study or the result to show you like a billboard and also Formula One, this suggests a systematic bias, right? 
again, we, we over reward or overrate many of the successful executives. On the other hand, we kind of treat too many of the failed as the scapegoats. The positive news is that now you're uh, listening to this talk, so probably you can formulate some arbitrage opportunity now, because all this can mean mispricing, isn't it? Good for you, because now you may potentially profit from other biases. So let me uh, revisit the open example, again, as a thought experiment. NFL, National Football League, where New England Patriots came from. Uh, of course, uh, 16 games making the overall performances less reliable than NBA, where 82 games were played. So not surprisingly, this uh, uh, less is more effect only occur in NFL, but not in NBA. How can you profit from this? The hint is sport betting. So let me, let me show you what I did. So I collect uh, all of this uh, sport betting data uh, in the past. And then I tried many different scenarios, how to profit from this exceptional performers. So these are the exceptional performances, right? Those team on this uh, top end, winning at least 15 games out of 16 in that season. Now is the portfolio that systematically works while well, making pro a positive uh, profit uh, return. Try to bet on the salient winners. They're the first game in the next season to lose. And 73% uh, here mean that if you invest $1, you got 1.73 back. So not so bad, isn't it? Something even better. Bet on the salient losers. So those teams that won fewer than five games in one season to win in the next game of the next season, and then the return is even higher. So this uh, first game focus, it's not surprising if you kind of think about it, right? Because after the second game, third game, they're probably going to adjust uh, their evaluation of the team. So it become more reliable, efficient. So there's no arbitrage opportunity. Market, small betting in terms of that is more efficient. But the first game or the preseason game, this is really the inefficiency. Market inefficiency can occur. They may anchor too much on the salient successes or failures from the set, uh, last season. And then this result also suggests an interesting asymmetry. The way we underestimate the underdog is much greater than we overrate the successful. So if you want to look at or look for this arbitrage opportunity, pay attention to the failed. So usually the mispricing is much greater over there. So this will be my hint. Great, so let's uh, wrap up the talk. So a lot of uh, people, uh, when they learn about my research on luck, will ask me, what about this conventional wisdom of luck? Like uh, if you work harder, you get luckier or chance favor the preparing mind and so on and so forth. My response would be, I totally agree with them. As long as you're talking about performances in the normal range, right? For example, if you want to well, be a poor performer, know nothing, no expertise, and improve yourself and become a good enough performer. Of course, a skill and effort matters a lot. There's no shortcut. There's no luck involved too much. You have to work harder. So that makes perfect sense. However, if you talk about the top performance and you want to move from good to great, for example, then this is where the, I would call it, unconventional wisdom of luck really matters, right? Being at the right place at the right time can overwhelm skill and effort. To such an extent, you have a negative association. So we really need to change our focus from this top performer, the outlier to, well, the second best, right? As long as we can identify this non-monotonicity and the second best should be our focus, actually. They are uh, a better target for learning and of course you should reward, reward them more. But this is really difficult. Like in business, one of the best sellers in the past 50 years uh, is this book or similar book like this, Good to Great teaching students how to move from good to great. And not surprisingly, the persuasion strategy is they usually select a few outliers, the exceptionally successful firm in their time and try to learn from them and inductively uh, having some principle about how to move from good to great. However, in my other paper, I show, wait a second, what happened to this uh, feature firms? Well, unfortunately, one third of them went bankrupted. 
within five years of the pub after the publication of a book like this. The other two or third actually underperform like a benchmark, like S and P five hundred index. So what happened after being great? It's not persistently being great. It's regressing, regressing downward to the mean, all the way to below mediocrity. So pretty bad, right? So uh, now you see my points. So probably you can see someone should write a book like this, right? It's much more uh, uh, useful and uh, well, uh, useful for students, right? How to move from incompetent to okay. But if I'm going to write a book like this, I guess uh, it won't really sell many uh, copies, isn't it? So that's the fundamental paradox, I guess, when uh, studying luck and its uh, implications. Great, so let's uh, wrap up my, uh, this is the final style of my talk. And of course, uh, many of you probably heard I have a book on luck, definitely not the title of uh, Incompetent or OK. But uh, if you want to learn more about how I conceptualize and quantify luck, this is one of the references I would recommend. Thank you so much for listening. And now I guess I can return to uh, the mic to uh, Ghana, open to discussion. Thank you again.